interactive movies. That's been a descriptor for video games for quite a long time, a phrasing that in my eyes seeks to delegitimize the medium as a whole. Uncharted is an awesome game, but do I care that it looks cinematic? No, not really, because the game is fun, the puzzles are neat, and the story's solid. It stands on its own, making the story feel like you are along for the ride and not just a passive viewer. That's something unique to the medium as a whole, something that we should treasure and hold and champion as such. But today, we're not gonna look at games like those. In fact, we're deliberately gonna look at games that are gonna try and be interactive films. Because I've played far too many of these games recently and I just need to dissect what makes them good and bad. So let's start with the golden standard and as we move along, we won't follow a path of quality because functional structure in video essays is overrated. When you look at Telltale as a whole, it's kind of weird that they did so well. A company that has big licensed titles but primarily sells their games by the chapter. And those games tend to play, well, the exact same. That doesn't seem remotely close to a recipe for success, but yet. That being said, the episodic nature of this genre in both structure and sales makes for the deepest choice-based stories that you can find. This stems from their emphasis on character-focused choices and the fact that they get to develop the narrative piece by piece using audience reaction as sort of a guide. Every breath you take and every move you make, every bond you break, and every step you take, Clementine is watching you. And all of the characters have set reactions to your choice. And heck, one choice can have so many different reactions. You have to pick the characters that you want the most. However, the devs can predict preferential patterns so they know when you like a character enough, they'll give you a decision that could very well kill them. They also know that you're gonna really try to ride the fence. It might seem easy to appease everyone in the story, but the game doesn't let you do that. In setting these hard rules, they force a heavy burden upon each one of your choices. While the outcomes are set, the story feels personal, which really should be the goal of the rest of the titles that I'll discuss. Moving on from the golden standard to, um, something lesser. Well, I don't really have a funny name for this one, so we'll just call it the David Cage standard. You know, beyond colon two souls, Detroit colon become human, heavy colon rain, indigo colon prophecy colon Fahrenheit colon whatever it's called in your neck of the woods those artsy fartsy auteur pieces that people really love for some reason games largely written and directed by one David D. Grutola or more well known by his other alias David Cage whose best work can be summed up by this glitched meme And by this lawsuit, where him and his team thought it'd be a grand idea to fully render Ellen Page's nude body despite not having her permission, and then leave said model in the game's code. Now I've played Heavy Rain and a few other of Cage's titles, and all I have to say is that quick time events are so incredibly dull. As a mechanic, they fail to add anything of real substance to the mix. But what Cage likes to do is use them to make the story beats feel more impactful. As if a series of button prompts are so difficult that people would fail and get a different path through the story. But more often than not, when you fail these quick time events, they bring you to a game over screen. That doesn't add depth, that adds trivial length and a sense of false agency in the narrative. If you like these games, then I'm not trying to say that your opinion's invalid. What I'm trying trying to say is that these titles are nothing more than smoke and mirrors. The idea is to create the specter of grandeur rather than grandeur itself. But when you shut off the lights and turn off the fog machine, all you're left with is a mess of wires and a shallow story that should have only taken three hours to tell instead of ten. Quick addition to this section, developer Supermassive Games has a lot of the same tropes that David Cage's games have as well. Until Dawn may have sold me with the temptation of Rami Malek, but quickly lost me with the convoluted story, boring and stereotypical characters and hollow choices. I just don't get why Supermassive Games and David Cage titles get so much praise when they're nothing more than vapid do-nothing games. And now on to a subject that only <laughs> will understand. You see, the 90s were a booming era for CD technology and subsequently full motion video. 
Oddly enough, I think that this era pushed full motion video to its absolute breaking point. Night Trap is one of the most ambitious FMV games I've ever seen. However, when most people talk about this game, it's usually in the context of the 1993 court case that helped establish the ESRB. But it's surprisingly deep and mechanically interesting. While voyeuristic and weird, the gameplay is unique. Playing this title without a guide or the internet would truly require a pen and paper and make you feel like a sleuth. The core loop has you seeking out vampires that are trying to sneak in and using traps to save the group, all while trying to listen in on the story. All the events are on a timer, so the player has to memorize all the moments when story details are given out and when the break-ins happen. Sure, the game is one of the strangest forms of interactive film on this list, but it stands because Wikipedia classifies it as such and we're not in high school anymore, so I can use Wikipedia as a trusted source. You can't tell me what to do. You're not grading this video. Now, I can't go on discussing discussing interactive movies without discussing the ones that cost over a hundred times more than your standard movie ticket to view. Space Ace and Dragon's Lair were arcade cabinets animated by the legendary Don Bluth. Every aspect of these games were designed to suck more quarters out of kids' pockets than the couch cushions, popcorn day at elementary school, and those carts from Aldi's combined. I understand how the cart system at Aldi's works. You put in a quarter, you borrow the cart, you bring the cart back, you get your quarter back. Simple, but what's stopping a fully grown man like myself from just stealing the cart, smashing the device on top, getting my quarter back, and now I have a cart. Sure, I could just steal a cart from everywhere else, but where's the fun in that? These arcade cabinets had players input certain movements when flashed on the screen. This required lightning fast reflexes and some memorization. The most dastardly part of all was if you got a portion of the way through the game, you weren't going to stop. You had to see where the story went. This was a different kind of interactive film for sure. The one where your control was limited by how long you got to watch, rather than deciding the fate of the character. Sort of the opposite of the quick time events you've seen in David Cage games, and a completely different type of player involvement. Despite full motion video games losing steam after the new millennium, there are still people making these types of games to this day. Publisher Wales Interactive put out quite a few titles in this genre. The first one I stumbled upon was The Complex, a title that they put out just this year. I had two reasons to pick it up. First, I heard that it had easy trophies. And second, it had Michelle Milet, Katie from Letterkenny, as the main actress in the game. On first flush, the game isn't all that bad. The story is intriguing, the cinematography was pretty good despite being clearly green screened, and there's an easy skip feature so you can go back and find all the endings. They even had a system in place to show you how much each character that you interacted with liked you. Not a robust system, but a decent step towards character-based systems seen in the Walking Dead games. So after this positive experience, I tried out Wales Interactive's big hit from three years prior. Late Shift garnered a lot of notoriety, some folks going even so far as to say that it's the most important game of 2017. The game puts you in the boots of a parking lot attendant who accidentally gets caught up in an art heist. The cinematography in this title is second to none. The color palette is filled with steely blues and burnt oranges, making you feel like you're really in an art heist. But that's where the praise stops. The story choices have little to no relevance. The game just keeps on a linear path. The only real choice at stake is the end. The story just feels hollow. It's not even that great of a heist movie. And this led me to question the very nature of the genre. And it's the very reason I'm writing this episode. Why do these games try so hard to be movies? Doing this, hurts the interactivity and really only gives you the illusion of choice. Honestly, I could just put the controller down and the game would have played itself. What's the point of this genre if the interactive half isn't even fun? But then I watched Bandersnatch on Netflix and my view changed. I had put off looking at Bandersnatch for a long time now, just for the fact that I think Black Mirror has some of the most shallow writings and themes. My parents had played it before and loved it and absolutely could not stop recommending it. But I held off because I find Black Mirror to be skeptical. Porn, a thrill ride for viewers who are afraid of changing landscapes and who think in worst case scenarios all the time. It's a show that avoids thought provocation in favor of gratuitous self-flagellation and it's easy to wave your finger at. Not saying that there's anything wrong with liking the show, but I find the structure and themes to be far too unchallenging and shallow. That being said, Bandersnatch is amazing. What, just because I spent that last section ranting about how much I hate the TV show, I should also hate the spinoff? That's goofy. That's like me saying, I hate the film Barnyard. Therefore, I have to also hate the 2006 smash hit game for the Wii Barnyard as well. 
That's a terribly reductive argument. Go sit in the corner and think about what you've said. Also, I'm not kidding about the 2006 smash hit Barnyard for the Wii. It's a paradigm shifting title and we should all appreciate it. You, you just can't put text on a screen to invalidate my very real point that the 2006 smash hit Wii title, Barnyard, isn't the very foundation of video games. Without it, where would Miyamoto be? Where would Kojima be? Where would Ed McMillan be? Without this, Skyrim would be reduced down to a Cooking Mama ripoff. Without the character of Otis, Laura Croft's Tomb Raider would just be nothing. It wouldn't exist. Square Enix wouldn't have even made it. Without this title, we would be reduced down to playing Flash Gotcha games on the Ouya. But back to Bandersnatch. I'm going to have to spoil this experience, so if you haven't seen it, skip to this timestamp. Or if you don't care, then just keep watching. You've been warned. So the beauty of Bandersnatch is that it showcases the inability to create true freedom inside a scripted medium. Trying to give the reader, the player, or the viewer true agency in the medium is what ends up driving these creators insane. It's a meta-narrative that breaks down the interactive storytelling as a whole and says player agency has its limits, and those limits are okay. Now that's where we run into the clash of ideals, because in this genre, we play as the character that we're making choices for. Therefore, when we're presented with options that we would not choose in that given situation, we're immediately pulled out of the story and no longer care about the options at hand. The very mechanic that entices us to play is the same one that causes us not to care. True agency can only be seen in games where the narrative is never set in stone. Online multiplayer, sports games, and D&D are the only stories that are written as they go. Branching pathways can become infinite if too many are added, which is why in the examples I presented earlier tend to pose their big choices in the last 80% of the game. These story branches grow exponentially and the production cost will most likely not cover 256 different ending paths. It has to stop somewhere or it'll never be be finished. What makes Bandersnatch work more so than a David Cage game or a Wales interactive title is that it's a non-linear story. Set pieces are reused and characters can die in return because it's sort of a Groundhog's Day type rule set. It's quite smart and really the only way to avoid ballooning production cost. Sets and through lines can be reused in different contexts. You can do different things in each playthrough and get a slightly different outcome every time. Oddly enough, Bandersnatch was the last piece of research I needed to do in order to make this video. And wouldn't you know it, it's the most important one. Oftentimes when the idea of interactive film comes up, most people liken it to a choose your own adventure novel. But the thing that makes those titles so hard to put down is the fact that the medium never offers choice. And it goes the same with film and television and is why Bandersnatch works. But video games already offer that feeling of choice, no matter how limited it may seem at times. I'm engaged with the character because the character engages with my button presses. I don't need cinematics to tell me that they're doing what I'm telling them to do. To truly understand a medium, we have to look at how it engages with its audience. Film does so passively, and video games do so actively. To add the moniker of film to a video game is inherently misunderstanding the medium as a whole. You really, you really want me to talk about Barnyard some more? I should save this for another video, but come on. How can you, it's, it's more than just a collection of video games. It's life itself.